What is up, guys? It is Joe. We are back. We're talking ball about the Cats today, both basketball and football. We're wrapping it all into one package, and if you can hear it outside, it is uh, in the middle of a severe thunderstorm right now in KC, so if you hear any crazy sounds, that's what it's coming from. But over the weekend, K-State got a ton of different news breaks for both basketball and football. We'll talk about everything I have scheduled out, a total of seven players, I believe, in both sports. But before I do, let me tell you this. If you like K-State Athletics, if you like the channel, consider subscribing. It does help me out a lot. It's a great way to support the channel and myself. And if you're interested, it does keep the videos popping up more often on your feed, as well as the subscriptions tab. But guys, let's jump right into it. This video is going to be kind of the benchmark of a... A way too many things to talk about weekend version, weekend update. That's what we're going to call this. That's the clunkiest title ever, but it'll be a big weekend update across both football and basketball for every player that visited or those I feel like deserve a big mention. So I'm going to try to keep it to about two minutes a player and rapid fire my way through this. But understandably, some guys I might trail on a little bit longer. Some guys I might skip through a little bit quicker. But let me start in with the first player here. We're going to start on football, then migrate in a little bit through to basketball. So starting off with a linebacker. We've got some linebackers to talk about today. Over the weekend, Kansas State hosted or is hosting, I should say. I guess it's technically Sunday morning at the time you see this. But Elijah Herring, the sophomore linebacker from Tennessee, he led the team in tackles. This is the type of player you're missing in Kansas State. I've got my notes pulled up over here on the right, so if you see me looking off the screen, that is why. Elijah Herring is a 6'3", 238-pound sophomore. He led Tennessee last season with 79 total tackles and also added a sack in there. Now, it's no secret that K-State's been pursuing a linebacker. They hosted a UNM linebacker, I believe, last week. I forget the name off the top of my head, uh, but he was a solid player as well. With K-State missing Jake Clifton for this season, next season, whatever the case is, K-State has been attacking the linebacker position hard in the portal, and we're looking at a guy like Elijah Herring. And let me tell you why that's a good thing. First things first, the kid can play. Everybody in this list can play. Elijah Herring is a dude you want to lock up. Get him in Manhattan. Get him on your team. This is a guy in the middle of the defense you can rely on. He's fresh off a visit from Colorado, and while I know that it seems like it's bright and flashy to go play for Colorado, the good thing is this. Yesterday, so Saturday, I guess technically the day I'm recording this, on Saturday, Colorado actually added a linebacker in the portal at the exact same position, a dude transferring from Michigan and then Charleston College, both in that same spot that Elijah Herring was kind of mocked into. So it's going to be interesting to see how that affects the recruitment, but it is something to follow. So Elijah Herring, I assume, would come down to Colorado, Kansas State, another school, but that immediately gives K-State a leg up on the competition. So Elijah Herring's recruitment, I don't know how long this process lasts, but it could be wrapping up here soon. I am optimistic he's going to end as a Wildcat, and I'm hopeful to see that come true. You add a dude with 80 total tackles to your squad and you know college football experience, that's a great thing. So that's Elijah Herring. He is our first player of the weekend to talk about. The second one, you all know who it is. We've all talked about him. I made a video on him. How about former Colorado running back Dylan Edwards? Now, if you saw the post, if you saw the tweets, uh, I believe that there were some rumors going around that Dylan Edwards was in Manhattan this weekend. He was. You saw it. Eventually, it was confirmed by on three's Pete Nakos, but there were some posts of him, you know, at in Aggieville at you know, House Party. I saw a tweet and a couple others. So there were some rumors flying around, but until Pete Nakos confirmed it, it wasn't a set in stone thing, I would say. Uh, but Dylan Edwards taking the visit to Manhattan this weekend entered the portal, I think, on Wednesday officially or something like that. Could have been Tuesday. If you want all my full thoughts on Dylan Edwards, I did make a separate video, and I'll link somewhere here. If I remember, if I don't, you know, it's, it's on my channel. But Dylan Edwards, he's a home run hitter. He's a heck of a football player. I know there was some drama involved in his first recruitment. I'm not worried about it. The dude's a different player. He's a different guy. You're still competing with, you know, Georgia, Texas A&M, Nebraska, UCLA. Uh, I forget the other one. Ole Miss, and, you know, that, th that group of schools. So there's good competition but he was hosted on the visit by Avery Johnson. I'm going to trust QB1's ability to seal the deal. Get the dude that he played Pop Warner Pee Wee football with. Get him back on the squad, man. This is a dude that deserves to be a Wildcat. And I think K-State fans deserve this. So I'm hoping that Dylan Edwards does make his way to Manhattan. I don't know what the timeline looks like for a lot of these guys, but Dylan Edwards taking the first visit to Manhattan is a big deal. If you can add him, you add him. That is priority number one in my mind. But also the staff knows that, hey, there's other good running backs if the opportunity doesn't come up. But honestly, where it sits right now, I think it's going to be tough for Dylan Edwards to look at the offer, look at Kansas State, look at Avery Johnson and the team, and say, I don't want to be a part of that. I mean, consider this. You've got Dylan Edwards from Derby in the backfield if he commits. You've got DJ Giddens already in the backfield from Junction City. Then you have Avery Johnson under center from Mays. Like three Kansas kids leading your team to a college football playoff. That is an incredible story alone, and that's going to help with some more recruiting in the state of Kansas as we continue to recruit the local talent and keep some of the top-end players in the state of Kansas. So Dylan Edwards, I am hoping, ends up as a cat. But moving on to the next player on the list that is still at the running back position, Utah State running back Devon Booth. Now, Booth is interesting because you wonder what the logistics are of recruiting two different running backs. I assume it's probably a first-come, first-serve situation based on the sense of, okay, with Devon Booth, 
He planned a trip to Oklahoma State and then canceled it because Oklahoma State landed a kid last night. In this sense, I'm sure it's somewhat similar where if Dylan Edwards ends up as a Wildcat, Devon Booth cancels. So I don't think it would just be a seamless transition to try to take both if that's the approach. Devon Booth is also a home run hitting running back like Dylan Edwards. 120 carries last season, 805 yards and six touchdowns averaging 6.7 yards per carry. But the thing that is a big differentiate in my mind, Devon Booth would be going into his senior year with the Cats based off of going to two years at Juco, one year at Utah State, coming for your senior year at K-State. Dylan Edwards has played one season. He's got a lot more eligibility left ahead. And obviously it depends because if you go to the NFL at a certain point, you know, it cuts some of that time down. But I would lean towards Dylan Edwards because of the hometown local ties. But it's also important to understand Devon Booth is a dog. This is a great player. I know there's a lot of people that are high on Booth as well. So it'll be something to monitor. But the next player, we are jumping to basketball. So football people, if you dip out, I love you. But don't dip out because this is a lot of good content too for basketball. We have another couple of commits this weekend. Two commits on the registry. And I'm glad to see it because I waited about an extra hour to record this video just in case I didn't know anything about commitments. But I was doing my research trying to find out, you know, where do these guys stand with K-State? And then boom, on the feed, you see my guy, Arkansas Transfer Center, Bayfall commit to Kansas State. He's a former McDonald's All-American, and I want to give a shout-out to my guy, KSU underscore fan, for going back and looking up something that I was interested in. Uh, he put out the tweet before I even had the chance to ask. So my guy puts out a tweet saying, Bayfall is only the fifth McDonald's All-American in Kansas State history, joining Tom Freeman in 1977, Daryl Cunningham in 1991, Mike Beasley, obviously, in 07, and then Wally Judge in 2009. So Bayfall in 2023 becomes the fifth McDonald's All-American in Kansas State history. But Bayfall has so much potential. But let me tell you a little bit more about the kid. Obviously, McDonald's All-American is one thing. So you already know there's upside there. You already know there's talent right there. He's a six foot 11, 200-pound freshman from Arkansas. He'll be a sophomore at Kansas State. He's a former McDonald's All-American, former four-star in the class of 2023. He was listed as the nation's 28th-ranked player, the fourth-ranked player at his position, so the fourth center in the class, and the number one player in the state of Colorado. He's formerly from Senegal, but Bay Fall has so much upside. Now, some people are kind of in that crowd of like, well, potential gets you fired, or upside is X, Y, Z. Some people weirdly discredit upside or potential, like they're like, well, we can't be banking on that if we're hoping, holding out hope that a player develops, then what are we doing? Bad take. Bad take, guys. I'll tell you this. Some people will look at this kid and say, okay, he's a project. It's going to take time to invest. Guys, the kid's a top 30 player in the class, six foot eleven, like has NBA potential. I think when people say he's a project, guys, these projects move fast in college basketball. This could be a one season project. The guy could be gone for the league, but he also has the potential to be here for three or four years. And I want to give a shout out to my guy, Emal Caleb, putting out a tweet discussing Bayfall and said, my favorite tidbit regarding Bayfall He's the same age and has the same amount of eligibility as Day Day Ames and Buddy Rich. We could be building something special around that trio in coming years. That's a great take, and that is a great thing to say. I understand that college athletics works this way, where you get a guy for one year, there's no guarantee you get him another year. Bayfall was a target that staff identified him early, and I want to say this because I think there's been some people that have brought it up to me. The idea that he's just, you know, he's a reserve big, or he's like a backup big, I don't want to say that that's just a, a chalk slate, like the dude is a backup reserve big, he's, you know, filling in for Jarrell Colbert. That's not necessarily the way you want to go. If the dude can show up and practice, put work in against the starters, be that dude, you know he has the potential, you know he has the ability, you saw it in high school, you can go out there and give serious minutes in the Big 12 Conference. This is your rim protector shot blocker. I mean, this guy can be a rim runner, he's got that athletic long frame that Kansas State likes, that Jerome Tang likes. I think there's a lot of great things about this addition, and he has multiple more years. If the development isn't just, hey, lightning in a bottle first year, he has more time ahead to develop. So Bayfall, hats off to the staff for that commitment. They moved quickly, they moved swiftly, and got him done. He only played nine games in his freshman season at Arkansas, but I'm not worried. The kid is a dude. He's going to be a great player, and I'm excited to see him step on the court. So shout out to the staff for a great job there. If you need any more insight, I'm going to read you the first couple sentences of his breakdown coming out of high school from Adam Finkelstein. I thought he did a great job, but let me just read this down here. Uh, there's a lot of stuff involved in this, so you can go read the full thoughts, but just for the sake of the video, I'm going to cut it down. Finkelstein said, Fall is a physically gifted big man with size, length, athleticism, and mobility. He runs the floor extremely well. He can slide his feet laterally and is a bouncy leaper. His best potential lies on the defensive end of the floor, where he is already a high-level rim protector who can block shots on and off the ball. He also moves exceptionally well laterally for his size, allowing him rare versatility in the pick-and-roll defender, as a pick and roll defender, excuse me, who can even be switchable in certain situations. So I like the addition. I wanted to talk about Bayfall because that is a kind of a buzzer beater in terms of the, as I start recording the video, we get a commitment. So shout out to the staff on that one. Shout out to Bayfall and I'm excited to see him play. Now the next two dudes that visited K-State were Clifford Amori and correction, it's Caliph Battle. That's on me. I'm an idiot. I was calling him Caliph Battle. 
That's all me. Caliph Battle is how it's pronounced. I wanted to go back and make sure, so I'm identifying that now, and I'm going to try to, you know, burn that uh, Caliph pronunciation to my mind and go to Caliph. So that's the way we're looking for. So Caliph Battle 2 K-State, I have a full video on it with my full thoughts, but let me just recap that quickly. The dude is one of the best scorers in the nation. He has the ability to be one of the best guards in the nation. And I went through and dove into his stats a little bit more because there was some stuff that stood out that I should mention here. So he visited K-State. It sounds like vibes are really high with Caliph Battle. There's been some different cryptic tweets from different accounts that kind of suggest that he's coming to K-State. I don't know. I don't have any insight on that, but I would love the addition. The dude can be a top five guard in the country. Let's be honest. He's already one of the best scorers in the nation. But one thing I like to see is when you look at guys that are already at a certain level in their career, you see where can they take a step next? Where's the next leap they can get to when they're already at such a high level? Obviously, you would say, well, they can go to the NBA, do it at a better level, better competition. With Caliph Battle, it smacks you in the mouth. He put up 14.8 points, 3.3 rebounds, and 1.3 assists last season at Arkansas after multiple years at Temple. The kids average more than 15 points per game in, out of four out of the five years he's been in college basketball. But the thing that catches my eye, he's played a total of 101 games. He's only started 32 of those. The dude has such a higher ceiling. Keep him on the court. Get him out there for more minutes. I mean, you go from a 26-minute guy to a 32-minute guy. Imagine the scoring increase that that can take. So, Caliph Battle would be a huge addition. Uh, quick thought, because I know people would like to highlight defense, whether it's Caliph Battle or Doug McDaniel. People are like, well, they're not good defenders. Guys, I don't think the de defense is such a cut and dry thing. If you haven't been a great defender in the past, you're not going to be a good defender next year. I don't believe that. I think a lot of it is coach's identity and his scheme. So, you look at a guy like LJ Cryer for Houston. Guy couldn't really defend many people in one-on-one -on -one situations at Baylor. He was kind of an undersized guy for his position. Now he's probably a top 10 defensive player in the country at Houston. Or maybe not in the country, but at least in the Big 12 Conference. He's a stud defensively. It's about effort, energy, and the system that you're in. So I think Caleb Battle has the ability. You see the athleticism. I think he's got that next gear to his bag. Cliff Amori, I'll keep it short and sweet. I know he's still visiting UNC. I know he's still visiting Alabama. K-State's not out of the conversation yet. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that's going to happen, but... Some of these big recruitments, we want to say, well, they're leaving Manhattan, they're done. They're not going to, you know, there won't be a cat. Honestly, with Cliff, the way this has been, you know it's a high-profile recruitment for a lot of these guys, and K-State's in them. Until you see a graphic with a logo on it showing where he's going to school, don't lose hope. So that's what I'd say about Cliff, because I think there's a lot of great stuff there. I've made multiple videos talking about Clifford Amore, but I do have another one on the channel as well. And the final player I want to get to, I'm going to try to keep it under the 20-minute mark here. We'll see if we can get there. My guy, Brendan Housen, the white flame, baby. The dude can shoot the piss out of the basketball, but commits to K-State this weekend and had an awesome video for his commitment announcement. Brendan Housen played at Villanova. He's a stud. He's a great shooter. But the thing that I love to see is he's not just focused on like, okay, I'm a lethal shooter. That's who I'm going to be. I think it was in an article with D. Scott Fritchin. I could be wrong on that, so I apologize if I got that wrong, D. Scott. But... Brennan Housen talked about how he wants to be a complete player. He doesn't just want to be a shooter. He knows he can have more to his game. I can show the athleticism. I can show the defense. I can show the facilitating. I love to see that because the dude has the size and the ability to do it. Now it's time to do it. So Brendan Housen, you know he's an elite shooter. You know he's a great player. A lot of these guys on your team, like you're not looking for a starter at every single position, but when you have guys that can be stars in their role and then transition to that point where they can be a starter and be studs for you, that's a great thing. You see Desi Sills, for the first half of the season, looked like the sixth man of the year in the Big 12 Conference. Coach Tang switches up the order and says, Desi, you're a starter. And then it unlocked Desi to go so much farther in the second half of the season. That's what K-State's positioning themselves with with these dudes. So I'm excited to see the addition of Brendan Housen. Plus, on that process, as you're working on your defense, as you're working on you know facilitating, you know you've got that shooting ability right there. So you're locked and loaded for every corner three. Every three you need to hit, Brendan Housen can hit it. So I'm excited to see what's there. Also should mention, shout out to the guy that said, when Brendan commits, we're going to be housing beers. I don't remember if that was on Twitter or not, but that was pretty freaking sweet. So if I start saying housing beers, lock that one in. But anyways, this has been your weekend update of Kansas State recruiting. I hope I got to everybody. I know there's more people out there, and I don't think I got everyone in time. But this is kind of an interesting format. I don't know how often I'll do this, but these weekends where we have like seven different nuggets of information, this is the style of content you're going to get for that week. But I appreciate each and every one of you guys. I will be back shortly because I know Coach Tang's mentioned they want to move fast in the portal. I know that... Chris Kleiman and the, and the football portal's wrapping up here on May 1st, I believe. I don't know if that's the deadline to enter or deadline to commit, so something to monitor there. But I love each and every one of you guys. I appreciate each and every one of you guys. Giveaway video is dropping on Wednesday at 8.30 a.m. Be tuned in to see who won the Lavender Quarter Zip. If you're interested in getting signed up for that, there's a link in the description. It is the giveaway form. Go fill that out, and you will be entered to win one entry per guest. But I appreciate each and every one of you guys. I love each and every one of you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Go Cats!